also the university I came from, so it's near and dear to my heart. Uh, here we talk about plasmonics for imaging and freezing. Good. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, everybody, for inviting us to this wonderful conference. I've had a really good time. It's a great place to share ideas and research. So. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Bethel University first. It's um, a liberal arts school in St. Paul, Minnesota. So people still bike in the winter, and it was negative six when I got on the plane. So it's nice to be here, right? Uh, beautiful brick buildings, um, kind of a suburban campus. We have about tw uh, 2,200 undergraduates. Our physics department graduates about 20 undergrads per year, uh, which is fairly good size. Um, and we have six full-time faculty working there. <coughs> Uh, we send students all over the place. We've been growing for, uh, for a while. This only goes to two, uh, 2012, and the next data point is up over here somewhere. So uh, the department's growing. We've been adding uh, applied physics majors, applied physics emphases, uh, and even adding some electrical engineering courses as well. Uh, many of our students want to become engineers. Uh, they come to Bethel to do a dual degree program with the University of Minnesota, typically. A lot of them end up staying because they like physics, right? So we have a lot of applied physics kind of emphasis that, that, that they latch into. Uh, you might re are some, uh, we recognize some of our students from RAU posters that we send around. Uh, we've done quite a bit of work with the uh, Advanced Lab Physics Association uh, as well. We have a tradition of kind of applied optics and optics research uh, at Bethel, really going for a, a few decades. Um, <clears throat> particular, I, I work on in nano optics. I'll tell you a little bit about that today. Uh, but we do sensing, a lot of spectroscopy. Uh, we've done holography, both digital and analog variants of holography. Um, one of our uh, professors, Keith Stein, is a PhD aerospace engineer. So he's using a lot of optical diagnostics to image fluid flow. These are supersonic uh, pulses coming out of the end of a tube, uh, taking at 50,000 frames per second with a high-speed camera using some optical shadow graph techniques. Uh, we do simulations of light propagating through nanostructures. That's kind of what I uh, specialize on. We have a magneto-optical trap um, using lithium atoms here. Uh, Here's a digital hologram of a Christmas tree with different colored laser beams that our students like to, like to flash around during tours and things. This is a few years ago. So in my group, I, I, I do a lot of nano optics. This is the, these are the students that worked with me last summer. This is my deck. It is warm in Minnesota occasionally, so you can, <laughs> you can eat outside here. Uh, so this was last year. and. We've heard a little bit about the importance of interdisciplinary research. Uh, there's actually two biology students mixed in there uh, that were working in the lab, and, and you'll see why in a bit. So you don't really need a big space to do nano research. That was an intended pun. Uh, <laughs> but Bethel's nano lab really is pretty small. But, but um, you know, you can cram a lot of stuff into a bench and into a corner and into a previous <laughs> closet. Uh, Right, so we have a, a, a SEM that, that we've purchased, not a tabletop, but a small one about the size of a desk. Uh, Home-built atomic force microscope, thermal evaporator for doing materials. Uh, a class 100, not a class 10 or a class 1, uh, like some of the bigger ones can be. Uh, just a, a, a laminar flow bench, wet bench, fume hood, soft lithography, photolithography, a lot of microscopes. Uh, Right now, we're doing a lot of Raman spectroscopy and super-resolution microscopy, too. So. One nanofabrication technique that we rely quite a bit on because it's low cost and it's easy to do is uh, we use a lot of templates. And we deposit material onto a template, and we can template all sorts of things that way. And I'll show you uh, kind of how we do that as we go forward. So here's the current research motivation. A, a little bit of background about the department, a lot of optics going on. And what I have done over the last few years, well, here's an understatement. <laughs> this is the right crowd to talk about. Light is an extremely useful form of energy. I think we all agree on this. Uh, this one has the buzzword. It's not quite um, nanotechnology stem cells for t fighting terrorists like we heard about yesterday. But nanotechnology really is quickly developing the potential to revolutionize lots of things. And it has really revolutionized our lives already in terms of transistors and, and uh, computational power. 
And it's kind of interesting because it's the size scale where physics, chemistry, and biology meet, right? If you think about the basic constituents of a cell, they're on tens of nanometer size, right? Uh, big molecules, proteins, and, and physics, you, you can all talk about the same stuff at that, at that size scale. So the question, as someone who does research with light, uh, a big question is how can you better see and probe into the nano world? How can you use light to look at things that are very, very little? How little are they? Well, I'm a meter tall, order of magnitude. I'm closer to two. A uh, factor of a thousand is a millimeter. Right, this is about a bug, uh, an ant. Factor of another thousand is a cell, a micrometer. Factor of another thousand is a nanometer, you know, roughly. Right? Uh, if New York to LA were a meter, then a nanometer would be a tenth of an inch. So very, very little scales we're talking about. So in order to see into the nano world, of course, we're going to have to do a lot better than this. <laughs> For those of you who remember uh, Gary Larson here, yeah, right? It's a mammoth. So we're going to be looking not at large macro scale objects. We're going to be trying to look at maybe even single molecules, uh, things of that size. So again, you can learn a lot about something just by looking at it. It's shape, right? Where it is. How many are there? Uh, you can also... You know, and light, of course, is an excellent way to look at things, but all waves experience diffraction or spreading out. So really, we can only distinguish objects or see objects or, or get the resolution, uh, high resolution images of objects that are bigger than the wavelength of light. And depending on what imaging system you're using, you're limited by the numerical aperture of, of your system. Uh, so visible light with a wavelength, you know, about 500 nanometers, you're only able to see objects that are about that size. And there's a lot of interesting things that are a lot smaller than that, right? Viruses or DNA molecules or nanoparticles or quantum dots. So how do you, how do you look at those things? I like this graph. Uh, <coughs> the naked eye hasn't improved much over the last 400 years, <laughs> but the optical microscope sure has, right? Uh, there's a period here where th things are hap not happening very uh, quickly, but you know, pretty much today we're down at the diffraction limit. You, you can image things with a very nice objective lens, pretty much as far as physics can tell you. Um, of course, you've got electron microscopes and scanning probe microscopes here, and those have atomic resolution, but they come with their own issues. Light is uh, non-destructive. You don't have to have things in a vacuum to look at things with light. Uh, and you can get more information too, like spectro spectroscopic information to tell what you're looking at. Uh, and of course, we heard of the Nobel Prize in 2014 on super resolution fluorescence microscopy trying to beat the diffraction limit. So there are tools available to look at this tiny scale, to see things at this very small scale. The research we're kind of uh, Pursuing then is using optics to, to image and probe and analyze and even tweeze or exert optical forces on nanoscale objects. Uh, but we're trying to do it without fluorescence. Right? Uh, so most current forms of super resolution imaging require tagging with a fluorophore, uh, a small molecule that will emit light from a known localized position. And then you can say, there it is. Uh, and I think we have a couple of talks on that, and these are very powerful techniques. Um, <clears throat> but unfortunately, sometimes it requires altering the natural state of the sample, and a lot of times that doesn't matter, but sometimes it might. Uh, so we're developing techniques that would be so-called label-free, uh, and they may represent a significant advantage. You can just view samples as they are in their natural state. You can look at them without having to fix them, fix them up at all. Uh, and it would be even better if we could extract information about the sample that we're imaging using all the knobs and, and, and uh, uh, tools that light can give us, right? Uh, wavelength information, spectroscopic information, polarization information, right? You can learn a lot about a material by looking at what light does. So thinking about light at the nanoscale, one way to decrease the wavelength of, of the light is to squeeze it using uh, metals. Right? So it turns out that metals and metallic nanostructures can squeeze light into very, very, very small spaces. And this is, forms the basis of uh, my research in nano-optics, right? uh, sometimes plasmonics, nanophotonics. It has several variants. Just as an example, a collaboration that we have with uh, Professor 
uh, Sangyung Oh at the University of Minnesota, we showed that you can transmit terahertz radiation or millimeter waves through a two nanometer gap in a, a metal film. And so that's a factor of a million in terms of squeezing light through this tiny, tiny aperture. Right. So metals can really, really squeeze light. And when you squeeze light down, uh, you get very high intensities too. You take the same amount of energy, you squeeze it, and the intensity is going to be going up. Uh, so we can fabricate little tiny gaps, send terahertz waves, or even uh, near-infrared light. When you think about, okay, the light is being squeezed into this little area, this little volume, it can have uh, effective refractive index of, of, of very big, 10 or even more, because yeah, it's being squeezed down. You know, light goes through a, a medium and its wavelength uh, contracts. You can have very high refractive indices. This is just another simulation of what these things look like. So metals, of course, are, have a lot of free electrons, and these free electrons can oscillate back and forth. These oscillating back and forth electrons represent an electromagnetic wave that can propagate in, in certain uh, cases across the surface of a metal, and those are, often, uh, those are called uh, surface plasmons. So a key here is that they have short wavelengths. Another drawing here of you know the charges in a metal film or a metal nanoparticle or metal nano gap, you get very localized uh, and very intense electromagnetic fields, very intense electric fields, like around a metallic nanoparticle. Sometimes these are called uh, hot spots, right? Because you shine a laser on a gold nanoparticle, uh, a lot of that energy gets focused down in, and these electrons are, are creating this extremely intense uh, electromagnetic localized uh, field right here. Uh, and it's very, uh, well, it's very hot, hot spot. So th this shows you can man manipulate optical energy on sub-wavelength scales, and this is really kind of the basis of our research. So then there's a, a molecule of interest sitting right there, right? It experiences a very intense localized field and applications of, of large electric fields, large electromagnetic fields surrounding molecules uh, include you know, biosensing, enhanced single molecule spectroscopy, photovoltaics, data storage, uh, optical nanomanipulation. It, it's things you can do with light on a bigger scale. If you can do it on a smaller scale, you can, you can do uh, a lot of things. Uh, our research focuses a lot on uh, spectroscopy here. So that molecule, you can excite it. Uh, we heard a little bit about Raman spectroscopy to, to examine the pigments in, in art, uh, artwork. Um, so Raman spectroscopy is a very powerful technique to, for label-free identification of materials. All right, this molecule will emit a characteristic fingerprint spectrum. Uh, and if you think about how much, how much Raman light you're getting from a single molecule just floating in, in vacuum, you shine light on it, you're not going to get very many. Uh, if you put that in a very intense electric field, a very localized electric field, um, the field is very high here, you can get a really large enhancement. And the number of photons emitted per molecule can be uh, factors of a million or a billion more than it would be if the molecule weren't close to this uh, metallic nanoparticle. So this is called surface-enhanced Raman spectroscopy. So the optics of nanoparticles has actually been around quite a bit, right? Uh, the field of plasmonics. Uh, if you take a chunk of gold, you chop it up, you can make, make gold. Because of these very strong uh, resonances and very strong interaction with, uh, with light that these nanostructures have, you can get lots of different colors coming out of different sized gold nanoparticles and so on. Uh, turns out not all, but some of the colors in stained glass windows are, come from metallic nanoparticles. You mix, you mix metal into the molten glass, you cast it out, and you can make uh, colors here. So a lot of the deep red is gold. Um, so the short probing range, meaning that the light is very localized, and the large intensities of these uh, resonances are ideal for imaging, sensing, and tweezing. And at Bethel, uh, we're doing research projects in all three areas uh, with undergraduates. So I'll talk about imaging first. So you have, a, you have a, a film of nanoparticles, a surface of, of, of metallic nanostructures, and you have molecules sitting on top of that. Right? You shine a laser onto that, onto that surface, 
and you generate these hot spots right, between cracks or at gaps or at bumps or in little holes or something that you've milled on the surface. And then these molecules have some temperature and they're wiggling around a little bit. And this, this phenomenon isn't entirely understood, but the basic idea is that these molecules wiggle into a hot spot and then they wiggle out of a hot spot. And when they wiggle into a hot spot, just thermally wiggle in, they blink like that. You get a large emission of surface enhanced Raman light. So you get a blink like this. And then they wiggle out and it blinks off. And they're not wiggling much, right? Especially if they're adhered to the surface, they're wiggling in and out on nanometer scales. So with every blink, every time, this is just a movie to show. This is a, a real time movie. This is what it looks like. It looks like looking at blinking stars, right? Every, every one of these blinks is on the order of a single molecule event going into a hot spot and coming out of a hot spot. And then you can take that blink and you can say, you can fit it to a Gaussian, right? You can fit it to a, a, a mathematical function. You can localize it very precisely. And here's the key to super resolution imaging in this way. You can localize an individual blinking element to within less than 10 nanometers, right? So you can localize it there. And then if another molecule that's right next to it also blinks, but not at the same time, if they blinked at the same time, you wouldn't be able to re resolve those two. But if one blinks and then two seconds later another one blinks, you can say, ah, there must have been a molecule here and then here. And in that way, you can slowly build up an image, just like an artist would do pointillism, right? You point, 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 point. And after a while, after a minute or two, uh, an image will emerge of the molecules sitting on that, on that background of, of these hot spots. Now we do a few things to make those hot spots uniform. We have to move those hot spots around during a couple ways, but uh, here's the basic idea. Here's two frames uh, from a movie. And each blink also gives you a full spectrum, right? Because it's surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. So if you can capture the blinks, you can form an image. If you can capture the spectrum, you can form a chemical map of your surface. And you can do this, uh, in a super resolved kind of way. So this is called, well, SIRS storm, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. And the storm is stochastic, meaning this kind of random blinking here, optical reconstruction microscopy. And storm is a well-known technique in fluorescence uh, super resolution imaging as well, except you're turning things on and off using other laser beams. This is just due to the random diffusion and motion of the molecules on the surface in these hot spots. So, several undergrads have worked on these papers. Uh, Ailey sitting in the crowd here had a, had a poster talking uh, about it. Um, some of the first things we imaged were uh, collagen protein fibers, right, a very uh, common protein. Um, we didn't have any biology collaborators yet, uh, so we became a little more sophisticated later on. Uh, but this is just a mic dark field microscope image of collagen protein. Here's a Raman spectrum from a certain point, so these peaks would, would correspond to, yes, this is indeed Raman. Uh, here's a diffraction limited image of this, and here's a super resolved SIRS image of the same fiber. So we're seeing very small features uh, of, this, of this, uh, this fiber. We can compare it to uh, an optical image of it, another diffraction images, and compare it to electron microscope images too. And we can see that the optical technique uh, kind of pulls out small features, like little 50 nanometer splits in the in the uh, uh, in the fiber. Since it's Raman imaging, we can have a background chemical pattern. Right? So we take a, a, a stamp. We ink it with a certain molecule. We stamp it onto a surface, and we can see that stamp uh, chemically. Even though, if you just look at the image, uh, these are the nanoparticles in the background here. If you just look at it with, with uh, without this, the, the, the spectroscopy, it looks just like the, the particles. But then if you include the spectroscopic element, you can see the chemical pattern in the background. So then we got some biologists on board, uh, and they started looking at bacteria. So we put a cell on the surface, and these little hot spots are interacting with the membrane of the, of the cell sitting right on there. And our idea, idea is to map this out. So here's an optical microscope of M. luteus bacteria. Uh, here's a 
diffraction limited. Well, this is actually a laser scanning image. And here's the storm image of that. Right, so you can see you can get lots of little details in here. And the, and the uh, biologists were, are, get excited about seeing details on the surface of a cell membrane. Uh, so we were pretty excited about these images. Um, and they overlay onto the, uh, it's kind of hard to see, but they overlay onto the electron microscope images quite nicely too. And again, of course, you're getting the, the spectrum from each. So it'd be really nice is to be able to get a spectrum over a whole surface. And you can do that by imaging through a bandpass filter and tuning it. And that takes about half an hour. Take a SIRS uh, image, you know, change your filter, take another image, change your filter. And you can build up a spectrum of the surface. And each of these peaks then correspond to a peak of, uh, of the, the, the material that, that you're looking at. Or what we've done recently is <coughs> just take a picture through a grating. So if you look through an optical grating, you see the zero order is the image, and then the first order is the spectrum. So now we're able to see every little blink. This is just a, a compilation of a few frames. Every little blink here gives you a spectrum over there as the first order of the optical uh, grating. So you can, then you can get a super-resolved cell image or a super-resolved spatial image, and every one of those blinks, you record it as a movie, every one of those blinks then gives you a, a spectrum. And we were able to tell the difference between two different types of cells, two different types of bacteria that look the same. They have the same shape, right? But they had their one uh, was gram positive, one was gram negative. And I don't really know what that means, but the biologists were interested <laughs> in learning about that, uh, that we can distinguish chemically between these two different bacteria uh, and then also see the structure of them on the surface. So that's been a lot of fun. Oops. Uh, and quickly then I'll talk about a couple other applications of these nanoparticles and the optics of nanoparticles that, we, that we're looking for. So again, the short probing range, it's an optical wave, an optical uh, measurement. It's going to be sensitive to whatever's around it. So if you change the refractive index, you'll change the, the resonant wavelength. You shine white light through an arrangement of, uh, of these nano not nanoparticles this time, but nano holes, and the color changes uh, when molecules bind on the surface. And this can form the basis of a, of a sensor. So a couple uh, students have come up with our nano nose, which is nano optical sensing, uh, because we've been using it to de uh, detect uh, gas vapors. Right? So we uh, put these nanoparticles on different adhesive substrates. Uh, and sometimes the adhesive substrate would swell when it's, uh, when it's exposed to ethanol or, or different vapors. And we'd be able to see down to 10 parts per million of, uh, of different gases. Okay. Because it's on a film, right? we have a nanoparticle film. We can stick it right onto a, a camera that's just in, like in your cell phone. Because it's a grading of nanoparticles, we see a spectrum. So we can also do spectros uh, spectroscopy here uh, with the different, uh, with the different gases that we're looking at. Finally, uh, tweezing, right? So short probing range, large intensities. Uh, th these localized fields can be, can be useful for manipulating uh, things with optical forces. So it looks like this. We, take <laughs> we fabricate a tweezers and we can go to DNA. Uh, no, the optical tweezers we've heard about a little bit and, and it's very useful uh, uh, and there's people who know a lot more about optical tweezers in this audience than I do. Um, but I do know that the force scales this way, right? Where A is the radius of the particle and the, sm and the gradient of the intensity of the light. Right? So if the particle gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the force drops off really quickly. So if you're trying to image and then sense and then tweeze things about the size of a virus, you're going to have a hard time doing that. You can increase the laser intensity quite a bit, but then you burn your sample, right? Uh, or you can increase the gradient, but you can't do that any more than the diffraction limit tells you. So let's use these, these nanoparticles with a very short uh, and very large field gradient. So it's not going to work for, for DNA really that way. Computer simulation of shining a laser onto a silver nanopillar. You can see there's a very intense uh, localized region of, uh, of electro electric field. That's a large gradient, large intensity. You're going to be able to tweeze particles on into that uh, nano post. 
So another student here had a, had a poster talking about uh, uh, tweezing with silver nanoposts, these little particles. So he kind of invented a, uh, an electron uh, lithography system using our SEM in lab view, and we, and we can make these little silver silver posts on a substrate. Uh, you put a solution of nanospheres, uh, microspheres on top of that, you shine a laser on it, you can, here's a little fluorescent bead, here's the little nanopillars, and this bead gets trapped. And if you don't have the nanopillars behind it, no matter how high we turned up the laser, we wouldn't be able to trap it. Right? It would just constantly be zipping around with Brownian motion. But if we're lucky enough, sometimes you have to wait, and one gets close to that, that little pillar, it'll get pulled in and you'll be able to tweeze it. Uh, so the particle is held in place to within about 80 nanometers uh, uh, R squared from its position. And then if you, it's kind of pretty fun, and then if you put, change the laser to circularly polarized light, the particle will orbit around the post as well because of the angular momentum of circularly polarized light. So in this way you can trap, you can tweeze, you can image, you can sense nanoscopic uh, objects. So there's my conclusion. Nano optics, imaging, sensing, and tweezing. Now we've had a lot of fun doing it. I want to acknowledge uh, a lot of collaborators, lots of Bethel students. We do this as part of a, a, a bunch of courses uh, that, that we do at Bethel University and then the funding agencies as well. So references and thank you. Walk away with us. Fraction limit using this head. John did ask. Okay. Uh, start by thanking the organizers and Jason for inviting me down here and get a little reprieve from the snow and get a chance to speak with you guys. Uh, so my lab at Bates is focused on developing and applying um, fluorescence imaging spectroscopy techniques. So today I'm going to talk to you about one of those in particular. Uh, but first, just a few fun facts about Bates. We're a small private liberal arts college in the middle of nowhere, Maine. Uh, for those of you who think it's cold outside, this is what we're coping with this time of year. Uh, it is pretty, but it's, it's cold. And we have roughly 1,800 undergraduates, and in a given year, we might graduate somewhere between a dozen and 20 physics majors. This year, I think we have 22. Uh, two are actually in the audience today, although uh, to my loss, none of them actually worked in my lab. But, oh well, I can't have all the good ones. So uh, I usually like to start by um, pointing out how optics can be used to kind of probe all the length scales of, of nature. Uh, but over the last couple of days, you got to see all kinds of wonderful talks about how that's done on different length scales. So I'll just quickly zoom in to the length scales that we're usually focused in in biology and thinking about the imaging technology that we, that we tend to use. So we're talking about length scales from down to small molecules up to large animals. So clearly, um, you know, just using our eye, we can see many things. And then for this region in the middle, we have our conventional light microscopy, which uh, has this kind of lower cutoff here because of, I'll show you in a few slides, diffraction, and, and Nathan also mentioned that. And we have this reliable, handy technique, electron microscopy, which I'm not going to speak directly about, which can get us down to the small molecule level. Um, but for a number of reasons, it would be really great if we could use our light microscopes to get down to the same length scales. And that's kind of the whole purpose of this new field that we're now calling nanoscopy, is how can we extend uh, conventional light microscopy down to the nanometer length scales and resolve things at this, at this spatial extent. So uh, hopefully this is a review for a lot of you, but if you're not familiar with fluorescence, the, ma the main takeaway here is to understand uh, is a simplified Jablonski diagram. So say we have some uh, small fluorescent molecule sitting in its ground state. An incoming photon comes in, which I'll call the excitation photon. The molecule can absorb that photon, get into its first excited state, and then after some amount of time, it'll give up that energy, get back to its ground state by giving off uh, an emitted photon that we call fluorescence. Now, I haven't actually drawn in these uh, vibrational energy states that exist in each, each of these states, but because of this 
uh, vibrational relaxation. We get some energy losses. So if you look at the excitation here in green versus the emission spectrum for a, a standard type of probe, you'll see what we get with this uh, separation called the Stokes shift between the uh, excitation and emission peaks, which is handy because it allows us to use filters to separate the excitation light from the fluorescence light, which is what we want to detect to form an image. So another important thing to keep in mind is how do we actually label something that we're interested in looking at. So whatever your favorite protein is, uh, the, there's a number of ways, but the two probably most common are to use antibodies, just like you know, your antibodies fighting off things in your body, to attach, say, a, an organic molecule to that protein, or even more cleverly, uh, you can take these proteins that were purified from things like jellyfish that naturally give off light uh, and genetically encode them to force your, your specimens to actually produce them for you attached to your favorite protein with some flexible DNA linker attaching the two. So this is how we can label something that we're interested in imaging. And now the problem is, is that because of the wave-like nature of light, if you try to use your microscope objective lens to focus a parallel beam of light, such as a laser beam, instead of getting a geometrical focal spot, because of diffraction, we actually get this extended intensity distribution that we call the point spread function. And the size of that point spread function is determined by diffraction. And I, I can't read the original papers because I don't speak German, but I trust my German colleagues when they tell me it was Ernst Abbe that originally worked this out. And the kind of in the focal plane, lateral resolution tends to be the wavelength of light divided by two times the numerical aperture of your lens, which is just a measure of how steep of an angle as you can collect light over. And in the axial direction, it usually turns out to be about a factor of two or three worse than that. So the reason that's important in image formation is if you're taking your microscope or any imaging system, and if you want to image, say, a point source, what you're actually going to see is you're going to get an image of the point spread function. So if you take some extended object, you can really just think of it as a, as a, as a superposition of point sources. And, and the image you're going to get is just going to be a superposition of these point spread functions at each corresponding point of the object. Or mathematically, you can think of that, or not think of it, it is just you take your object, you convolve it with the point spread function, you get your image. And the practical result is whatever it is you're trying to look at it gets blurred out according to your point, the size of your point spread function. And again, it was Abby that told us, and this is usually we call this Abby's equation, that because of this fundamental limit, if we're working with high NA lenses in the visible spectrum, you're not going to be able to resolve structures smaller than around 200 nanometers. So if we go back to our, our biological length scales here and think about what that means, well, a point spread function is going to show up around here on the scale. So while it's going to be great for imaging things like cells or large organelles within a cell, uh, we're going to be pretty limited if you're trying to look at substructure in something like a virus or, or individual proteins themselves. So this is for you know, a little over 100 years stood as a hard resolution. Is This is the fundamental limit to what you're going to be able to see in a light microscope. So you might ask, well, why don't we, why don't we just give up and use things like electron microscopy? So uh, there's a lot of answers to that. There's pros and cons to any technique. But uh, despite the limited resolution and other limitations of fluorescence microscopy, there's still a lot of advantages. And um, the main ones are being that we have uh, the ability to image multiple species, multicolor imaging. Uh, the sample preparation method is a little less invasive than it is with electron microscopy. So it's more compatible with live cell imaging. So because of these reasons, uh, a lot of energy has been put in how can we get around this fundamental limitation. And so what comes next, I'm um, essentially going to explain to you one of the approaches. Uh, in Nathan's talk, he mentioned the single molecule technique. So I'm going to talk about another technique that we can actually try to get beyond this diffraction limit. So if we go back to our um, Jablonski diagram. So the first thing I said was, right, we can excite to the uh, with an incoming photon, get the excited state, and we get our fluorescence when it relaxes back to the ground state. Now it turns out that while, and it's usually a few nanoseconds that, that this process takes before it actually relaxes and, and gives off this fluorescence photon. So it turns out if, while it's still in the excited state, if you send in a second photon that's going to be red shifted from um, your excitation photon, and it has to be tuned to kind of match this, this energy gap, you can actually force the molecule back to the ground state by stimulated emission. And this is the same stimulated emission that's this in the SEN laser. 
So laser, we're using stimulated emission to amplify light. Here in what we call STED microscopy, we're using stimulated emission to shut off the light. So this is giving us an optical switch. We have a way to quench the fluorescence. And so the reason this is important or beneficial for us, so if you think in, in our conventional microscope, we've got a kind of Gaussian shape, diffraction limited focal spot. We'll collect fluorescent signal from a corresponding area. And the size of this, again, is limited by diffraction. So with a STED microscope, we start out with the exact same situation, but now we take a second laser beam and we shape it like a ring or a donut, we say, even though that's not a very scientific term, but it's, it's tasty. And now what happens, because we've shaped it to have zero intensity in the center of where our excitation beam is, high intensity on the edges, we're essentially going to shut off uh, fluorescence in this area. And we call that depleting the excited state. So if you think about the, this is the, the depletion profile, essentially anything, any fluorophores in this area will be shut off. They won't be allowed to fluoresce because of this stimulated emission effect. Now the result of that is you'll now shrink down the size of your effective focal spot. So you've now increased your resolution. Now this is, this is important to recognize. We've now, even though we've just improved our resolution by superimposing our, our donut-shaped stead beam, this is still, at this point, diffraction limited. We haven't broken the diffraction limit. And the reason is, is that the size of our donut-shaped focus is itself limited by diffraction. So the key step comes in. If we consider, and this is a cartoon, but, but most molecules behave similar to this kind of decaying exponential. If you consider the probability that a molecule will be able to fluoresce as a function of the intensity of this stead light that experiences, it behaves roughly like a decaying exponential. So we can, in practice, kind of say there's going to be some kind of cutoff intensity where we can effectively say the, the intensity of this light is higher than that. We've effectively shut off the fluorescence transition. For lower intensities, it would still be on. So we have this on and off switch. And because of this nonlinear effect in the, in the probability of fluorescence, we can saturate that transition. So now, this might be hard to see, but this is supposed to get brighter. So if we jack up the intensity of that focus, we can saturate this depletion profile, and now we can really squeeze down that effective fluorescence focal volume to arbitrarily small sizes, theoretically. In practice, it turns out, well, how much intensity can your sample actually tolerate? So three things going on. There's an as a optical switch between the excited and ground states. We have this, this transition that gives us a switch, fluorescence on and off. We can saturate that, and then we combine that with this point spread function engineering, and now we truly have diffraction unlimited imaging capabilities. And now, it turns out that the, the size of our STED point spread function turns out to be kind of a modified, or approximately a modified version of Abbe's equation, where we now have this factor of one over the square root of one plus the peak intensity in our, in our depletion focus divided by some characteristic saturation intensity, which is roughly how much light it takes to quench half of your fluorophores. But because you can essentially crank this up to as much power as you have available, we would say this is now a diffraction unlimited imaging technique. Again, in practice, you have to worry about, well, can my sample actually tolerate uh, some level of intensity? Uh, so in practice, how this is set up is fairly straightforward. You start with your basic confocal microscope geometry. You've got an incoming laser beam. Uh, being focused into a sample, you collect your fluorescence, bandpass filter it, focus it onto a point like detector. Now all you need to do is send in with another dichroic mirror, send in your stead laser beam, use something called a phase mask to actually get it to focus so that you get destructive interference at the center of the focus. This gives us our donut shape, and now we can get a much smaller effective focal volume. So if you think about the spectrally, we really you just have one more uh, uh, laser line to, to kind of manage, but you still leave yourself a nice uh, region where you can detect fluorescence. And it's actually important that this um, uh, stead wavelength needs to be kind of tuned to the tail of the emission spectrum to actually avoid anti-Stokes excitation and a few other undesirable effects. And usually the most common question I get asked is like, well, how do you how do you actually create this? In the easy ways, you can actually buy something called a vortex phase play, which is just uh, kind of glass uh, that's been nanodepositive to kind of give this ramp and thickness up to one to one wavelength, or one wavelength being two pi phase difference. So essentially, it's just a zero to two pi phase ramp combined with circular polarization will give you this um, donut shaped focus. In practice, it's a little tricky to get that, but uh, the concept is straightforward.
So here's, here's one example, and this is the physicist's favorite fr uh, sample, which is our, our fluorescent bees. So we, we, know how, we know what spheres should look like, so we're happy when they look like spheres. Uh, so here would be, if I just had my excitation laser on, this would be a conventional confocal image of my 20 nanometer bees, which have fluorescent dye throughout their volume. And now if I turn on the, the stead laser, take the same image again, and now you can see we can actually resolve all these individual beads, which otherwise were obscured by diffraction when the image was blurry. Um, and we can also use these as a nice test sample to estimate our resolution by measuring the width of one of these individual beads. So if I zoom in and compare the conventional image, so again, this is going to be, for these wavelengths used, this would be roughly 250 nanometers in width. And I can measure the profile of my stead image and actually fit a, a Lorentzian function to that to get the full FF max. I get about 26 nanometers. So about a factor of 10 better than the classical resolution limit. And that's in one direction. So if you consider in, in 2D, that's a, about a factor of 100 in area that you're actually able to resolve. Now this is actually, I should say, this is not from my lab at Bates. This is from a, a microscope I, I built during my postdoc days. Um, in which I had access to more expensive, higher-powered lasers. So it does turn out that the lasers that you, you are available these days are, are oftentimes prohibitively expensive to get these high-powered pulse um, picosecond lasers with high rep rates. So it turns out you can get the same um, effect by using continuous laser wave lasers at a much cheaper cost, which is what I've implemented at Bates. But it turns out you actually sacrifice some resolution because, for instance, if I'm still using a pulse excitation and using a continuous wave, I can still have high power, but now I've spread all that light out that it's not being efficiently concentrated into that same time period when the excitation is, is uh, acting. But it turns out there's a clever way around that that was also published by the Hell Lab. Uh, and so it turns out, if you look at the average lifetime of a fluorofinally excited state, again, you get this kind of exponential decay effect um, where it takes some average time, usually a few nanoseconds, to, for the fluorophore to actually relax back to the ground state. And they were actually able to show, if you image, say, a single small particle, this would be the confocal. This would be if I just turn on my continuous wave stead laser. Yeah, I get a resolution improvement, maybe not as good as it could have been. And they actually had some sophisticated electronics and did something called fluorescence lifetime imaging. And they actually were able to show and, and work out the theory that demonstrated it should be this way also, that it turns out at the outer edges of this image, these are the photons that are emitted first. So what they realize is that if you're willing to throw away a little bit of your signal and get rid of these photons that are arriving the earliest, you can actually get another factor of two or three resolution improvement just by sacrificing a little bit of your signal. So by uh, just kind of time gating your detection, we say, we'll say we'll just ignore the first couple nanoseconds and then just detect. And then you can cut it off on this end too to kind of reduce background because it's a low probability that you get a fluorescence at this time, these, these times anyway. Um, so now using much cheaper laser systems that are easier to use, you can get down to the same couple tens of nanometers resolution at much lower cost. Um, so here, this is actually an example of the, the setup I have in Bates. This, these are 40 nanometer beads. Here's the confocal, here's the stead, and here's the G stead, stead with the gated detection. And if I zoom in on a, on a small spot here, you can see here just a big blur in the confocal image. Well, our normal stead with a continuous wave depletion, all right, we can resolve them. But now you can hear by throw away those first two nanoseconds worth of photons, I can get even better resolution. And if I look at the profile across that, hey, you can now see in the gated image, again, I'm now down to measuring the actual size of the bees themselves. So the resolution in this case is probably a little bit better than 40 nanometers. So I'm pretty happy. This, this so this was our high five moment in my lab. And uh, there were carbonated beverages involved too. <laughs> Uh, so just one example, this is a project that I'm working on with some biological collaborators at the University of New England who are experts in chromatin biology. So we're trying to understand some different uh, states of chromatin, which is how DNA gets packaged in your cell nucleus, um, in this particular uh, leukemia cancer cell line, which can be differentiated into different cell types. And here's just an example of one, one state of chromatin we're interested in which they've discovered back in 2011 which they call epichromatin which it turns out there's this state of chromatin which is just inside the nuclear envelope and and um, it's what its actual function is unknown that's what we're trying to figure out so here at the top you can see kind of a section through the center of the is someone keeping track of time am i okay 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 well 
Okay. So here you can see the kind of classic conventional images here, the state images below. Here's a kind of a section through the uh, uh, center of the nucleus. Here's kind of at the bottom where you can kind of see what's going on. So here you can see, we can see this actually restricted to a much thinner layer next to the envelope than you would expect from the classical image. And here we can resolve all kinds of uh, substructure that you otherwise wouldn't be able to see. And here's just what it looks like in mitotic cells. Now, actually, one the first question I get from biological audiences is, well, how do you know the dye isn't just stuck to the membrane? So it actually turned out in this original paper, they did some control experiments where they made the nuclear envelope swell, and you can actually see with conventional two-color uh, microscopy that you actually uh, get distinct layers if you swell up the nucleus. So we do know that this actually is inside the, the envelope. Uh, and I think I'm actually going to skip this in the interest of time, but this is a, another part of that study where we're, we're essentially exploding the nucleus so that all the chromatin fibers kind of spill out in a layer. We can actually study how their, the dye is, is uh, attached uh, along the length of these fibers. And, you know, we try to be quantitative, too, since we have this additional information. It's nice if you can say something about the quantitative about the structure. So we're actually able to show that this thickness of this uh, epichromatin layer is, is about 80 nanometers thick. Okay, so back to, to the idea of shaping your, your stead beam to give you this resolution enhancement. So if you use this 0 to 2 pi phase ramp to get to our donut shape mode, if you look at the axial profile, this is what it looks like. So if you look at this, you can immediately say, well, there's no intensity above and below the focal plane. So the resulting fluorescent spot you get is like this long cigar shape. So even though you can shrink laterally this down to you know tens of nanometers, you've still got conventional uh, diffraction limited resolution in the axial direction. So this would be in comparison, right, we get the same axial resolving power. So there are a few ways you can you can also get resolution improvement in the axial direction. Uh, one simple way is, is to use an alternate phase pattern, which is just a, a half wave or pi phase shift step. And this gives us, you still get a, this is a little hard to see, you'll still get a ring like we do with the donut here, but now you get the majority of your light will be in these lobes above and below the focal plane. And now you can actually quench your, and, and squeeze your focal volume down in all three dimensions, and you can get roughly something on the order of uh, 100 nanometers in all three dimensions this way. Usually a little bit worse, maybe 200 nanometers in the Z direction. So, and here's an example of um, a 3D image taken using this, this 3D stead point spread function. So this is... Um, it's going to be an image of a zebrafish retina, and I, I didn't prepare this... Um, our biological clarity, I used to have these zebrafish as pets, so this is very traumatic for me. So essentially, they take the zebrafish and they make a section of the retina, and they've now in this, uh, these, this layer, this, an inner, inner layer and outer layer, where they're looking at this protein called ribeye, which makes these horseshoe-shaped structures that are you know, on length scale smaller than the fraction limit, and they're believed to be involved with how the, how the eye um, processes light, although their function is unknown. So here's your classical uh, confocal image on the left, the stead image on the right. I, this is 5 by 5 microns. I keep forgetting to put the scale bar in there. And the axial direction will be into the board. So uh, here, you, if you're looking carefully, you can see we can actually resolve these horseshoe-shaped structures, which are otherwise just big blurs in the confocal image. So this, this is nice. Um, so the problem is this was a 50 micron I believe, section of, 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 the, of the retina. And this image was taken just above the cover slip, so at the bottom of that tissue layer. So the problem is it turns out if you go any deeper into the tissue, because of aberrations induced by the tissue, we're actually no longer able to get an image. So one of the things that uh, I've been working on the last few years is to combine adaptive optics with stead microscopy to try to find a way to be able to image deeper into tissue and get around this problem. So we had, I can go through this quickly. We had a nice uh, talk about adaptive optics in astronomy last night. Everything you heard ex translates exactly to microscopy world. So normally you take a plane wave front, focus into a spherical wave, get our ideal focus. And actually the same thing holds for when you collect light in the opposite direction. Problem is you put a biological sample. Now because of index of refraction heterogeneities, usually because of lipids, you can now get these aberrations which will essentially spread out that light reducing your resolution and also your contrast. So the idea is now if we can put in an adaptive element and somehow determine what these aberrations are, we can correct for them. So that's the, that's the project. How do we actually figure out what that should be? And 
So just to show you, ideally, this is actually a real measured point spread function now. This is what you expect. Um, but because of aberrations, the main problem is you're shifting light into where you would normally want to have that intensity zero. So instead of getting resolution improvement, you're essentially just depleting all your signal and not actually getting a, a super resolution image. So instead of a deformable mirror that we heard talked about last night, I'm actually using a spatial light modulator, which is just a liquid crystal display with electrodes that kind of allow you to just treat it like a monitor with an 8-bit image and, uh, and modulate the phase pixel by pixel of the beam. So we put the spatial light modulator in the stead beam path. And we start out, and again, this, these are pretty easy to use. You treat it just like a third monitor, and you just, just display an 8-bit image onto it. And you start by applying a flatness correction. This comes with the manufacturer. And I've, you know, going into the objective, you've got a round aperture, so I don't get to use the whole area. So just this area is actually uh, relevant to what goes through the sample, through, through the objective to the sample. So we start out with a flatness correction. You put on your stead phase mask if you want to do a 2D resolution or 3D resolution ambit. And then because phase is additive, you can add in any sort of other aberration modes, any other phase modulations you want. So you, you see the stripe pattern. Uh, because it turns out you actually need to, to use this into what we call an off-axis hologram. So you actually need to use this blaze gray to diffract everything off into the first order, and that way you don't have to worry about any unmodulated light getting through to your sample. So you have full control over whatever it is you're trying to modulate. So these are the patterns I turn. I use Zernike polynomials. I find them convenient because they represent kind of common aberrations in the imaging system. Uh, in my experience, the, these are kind of the dominant for biological samples, these lower order. If you're interested, here's the mathematical formulas. But actually, all I wanted to point out is actually the first three modes are just what we call displacement modes. All they do is shift the position of the beam, and it's these, these higher order modes that actually represent optical aberrations. And this turns out to be uh, very useful. So. Last night we, we heard about diffract wavefront measuring. It turns out that's actually pretty challenging to implement in, in microscopy. So instead what we do is a, a technique called sensorless, uh, a sensorless approach where you have to introduce an aberration into the system, calculate some, some property, and then say, did the image get better or worse? And then see, well, you know, can I, if I do that as a function of a bias aberration, can I determine what the aberration must be? Now, this is, uh, for quite a few years now, this has been implemented in confocal, multi-photon type of microscopy. And the simple way is just add up the pixel values. When the image is the brightest, you've corrected for the aberration. Turns out it doesn't work quite that simple for STED, and I'll, I'll show you why. And there's a lot here, but if I just focus on a coma mode, and so the black line, you notice if I try to add in a bias aberration, add up the pixel intensities, when the aberration is removed, you're actually, you actually get the dimmest image. So sometimes with the stead beam, you actually correct it when you get the dimmest image and not the brightest. So because of that, we actually worked out a kind of combine the sharpness or kind of the, a measure of the resolution with the brightness, and we we're able to produce a metric in red that kind of gives a nice quadratic peak every time you're at the corrected value. So here's our, ben, again, back to our bead samples, image through, in this case, 55 microns of glycerol, which is index of refraction mismatched from what the objective is expecting. Uh, and already the, the convocal image in the axial profile here, you can see, are extended a little bit beyond what you would expect from diffraction. Now, I turn the stud beam on. I basically just get a dimmer version of this. No help. If I run the correction routine, now I can get back to a nice sharp uh, sub-diffraction image. And here, if I, if I look at the axial profile here, basically, like I said, I've just got a dim confocal image. And now to get back to the super resolution, we have to apply these corrections. And here's just a 3D volume rendering of the same data. So in that example, it's just an index of a fraction mismatch. We just expect to have spherical aberrations. That's pretty simple. So to make it a little more challenging, we actually took zebrafish sections, put the beads on top of different thicknesses of actual tissue and where we don't know what to expect in advance. And here you see we can essentially get the same correction. Here's 14 microns of tissue. Uh, here's 25 microns of tissue. And we can, you know, in this case, get back to about 200 nanometers in the Z direction with, with again, who knows what, what the actual aberrations would be in advance. And it also turns out we can play around with these displacement modes and use the same sort of um, sensorless approach to optimize some metric to actually auto-align the microscope. So if the confocal 
excitation beam is, is stationary and you're just shifting your stud beam, you can actually have a nice easy way to align the two foci without having to manually tweak mirrors. So here I've kind of intentionally misaligned the excitation and the stud beam. And so if I go to take an image uh, within this with this misalignment, you can actually see that the stead image is, is way off center from, from the center of where the bead actually is. And here you can see the profile. So now I can run our correction routine with the displacement modes. And now we get back to a nice li lined up system. And here you can see it's, that's reproducible to about four nanometers. So now I would argue you're not even going to be able to get that good tweaking knobs by hand. And now it, this is a clever way. You're imaging. You can just periodically take your sample of interest off, throw on a bead sample, run the routine and you're good to go all day. So this makes it really easy for the students to um, be able to do an actually image ap imaging application without spending half a day aligning the microscope. Um, and uh, I'll just summarize quickly by saying, in order to go from microscopy to nan nanoscopy, the, the secret was really between the interaction of the optics and the properties of the molecules themselves. And I'll just acknowledge my collaborators. These are the students who have done STED-related projects in my lab at Bates and uh, my funding sources, and thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Sorry that was fast, but I was determined to end on time. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for having me here. It's been a great workshop and a great winter school. Uh, excuse me. I realize this is the, the session from people from the north, so indeed this is the as north as you can get. We're coming from Montreal, Canada. Uh, I've been, I started a lab there about 10 years ago, and I'm also, I just kept a position at Harvard Medical School. And as you will find out, I am a co-founder of a startup called Castor Optics, which prompts me to disclose my conflict of interest to start. So we I have a full appointment at Polytechnique Montreal. We, two and a half years ago, started with a colleague, a company called Castor Optics, which is a strategic um, partner of a company you might know called Thor Labs. Um, so during this uh, presentation, I'll be talking about the fiber optics work that we do at Ecole Polytechnique, why we, do, why we improve the fibers, and also um, what has been our commercialization path. So if any of you has any entrepreneurial spirit in you, uh, this might be a talk that is of interest. So as I said, this is the s session from people from the north, so if we leave Arizona going all the way north to Montreal. Montreal is actually an island in one of the French provinces, of, in the French province of Canada. Mont Montréal means Royal Mount, so we're on an island. Uh, there's a mountain right in the middle, and on one side there's McGill University, which is an English university, and on the other side there's University of Montreal, and its engineering school is called École Polytechnique. Uh, we're about 220 faculties there, 10,000 students. We bo have both undergrad and graduate programs, uh, all in engineering. So I teach in both biomedical engineering and engineering physics. And in terms of optics uh, faculty, we're about a dozen people. Three of us are working on biomedical optics, but we, have, we, we span all the areas of optics. Um, many students in my lab, one of whom is here, Xavier, who, uh, who, who with whom you've been interacting, and uh, his research will be also uh, displayed here. So, our raison d'être at Polytechnique, I'm very much between the physical sciences and the biomedical sciences. I tend to have a foot in the OR and a foot in the lab. Our raison d'être is to keep these guys happy, so we're essentially making uh, systems uh, that go in the clinic, that see patients with, with image upwards of 100 patients. And if you think that bringing a system through a, CSA, a TSA agent is hard, uh, we also have to face the clinic, so with the probability of a, of a nurse or, or a system being dropped down as you are trying to sterilize it. So we are making systems that are typically fiber-based, so the risk of misalignment is much smaller. So our goal is to improve endoscopy. Endoscopy means uh, being able to image inside the body. 
And uh, the different axes that we have in the lab is to either improve the size and flexibility of the instrument itself. Uh, we also want to add, when possible, stereo stereoscopy, so the ability of seeing depth. Uh, we'd like to improve resolution, the depth of imaging, and also the contrast. And what is our approach, being physicists and engineers? We are trying to create dedicated instruments to, uh, to do that. So the simplest way to see the smallest endoscope is either you put a camera inside the body or you go with fiber optics. So the simplest and smallest instrument you can think of is a single fiber optics, which is essentially as thick as my hair, so 100 microns. And you put a scanner to have a 2D image. So the, the basic endoscopy system will have a laser, a fiber, and scanning mechanism and some optics at the end. And in order to improve endoscopy, you can tackle any one of these four uh, uh, instruments. So you can improve the laser, and this is something that I worked on during my PhD years in Boston. Uh, we also work on micro-optics. A lot of work has been done in this school by Professor Gmitro and Andy Rouse in miniaturizing the optics, having high resolution and small diameter. And the, the challenge that I gave myself going to Montreal was to see if there was a way to not only use the commercial optical fibers that were developed for the telecom industry and to see if we can modify those designs to have a design dedicated to medical imaging with the constraints of medical imaging. So the products that we had in the lab, this is the, what I'm going to talk about. This is a fiber optics coupler that was designed specifically with the constraints of medical imaging. That's what we'll talk about today and how this animal was, in a, in, in, in a matter of a few months, translated into an instrument that you can now buy of the Thorab's website and that is integrated into medical instruments. So single fiber imaging, uh, there are different ways to use it. Uh, typically, we are using single mode fiber because it can deliver light and preserve the coherence property of the laser. Uh, it's been used in OCT, in wide field endoscopy, and also in confocal microendoscopy. The problem, however, is that you're limited by if you want to have single mode propagation of the laser to, re to preserve the coherence of the laser, you're going to have a, a fiber that is 100 microns in diameter, but the area that propagates light is effectively only 10 microns to have a single mode. What we're working on, uh, working with in Montreal, is what we call a double clad fiber. It's a fiber that combines the advantages of a single mode fiber at the center, shown in red, with the advantages of a multi-mode fiber, which is a much greater diameter. It does not preserve the coherence property of light, but it allows you to propagate much more photons. And if so if you combine these, then you end up having the advantages of having the laser being delivered to your sample. You can have the highest resolution, but you can have, be, have diffraction limited resolution. But as the sample, which is very diffusive, will scatter light, you'll have some ballistic light going back into the core, but you will have much, many more photons that are diffuse and that you can gather with the inner cladding. And because the inner cladding is has a 10 times greater diameter, it has a 100 times greater area, so you have the potential to collect much more photons. So ex examples of using double clad fibers have included combining OCT with autofluorescence. We can also have imaging that has a much greater depth of field, less speckle and also higher intensity, and we also show some improvement in confocal microscopy. The problem with these fibers is that there were no instruments that allowed to talk to the core and the inner cladding separately. So you'd have to come up with a, uh, a free space set up with beam spreader, lenses, and this is the perfect recipe for disaster if you go to the clinics because aligning single mode to single mode, mode if you have vibrations, you have back reflections, the signals we deal with in the clinics are really, really small. And so we wanted to come up with an all-fiber device, and this is what we did several years ago in Montreal in a device called a double-clad fiber coupler. So this is a standard fiber coupler. Uh, you take two fibers together, you, you, you put them in close proximity with a torch, you're going to melt them together, and then you're going to taper them. You're going to create a super mode at the fuse section, and if you can 
if you understand and control the parameters of this super mode, you can decide what fraction of the power goes in one branch and what fraction of the power goes into a separate branch. Here, we we're making a standard coupler, but with a non-standard fiber. So the trick was to come up with a way to have a, a coupler that is um, a null coupler for the single mode. So single mode is in red. We wanted to send light from port one to port two in the red section without coupling. So we want to send 100% of our laser light to the sample. On the way back, the ballistic light will go into port two in the, in the single mode area. We wanted to, again, send 100% of the light from port two to port one. But we wanted to also be able to gather light from the inner cladding, the white area, and be able to transfer most of it to port three. So it took us a couple of iterations, playing with fibers that had different NAs, different uh, diameters, and we were able to essentially extract most of the light to port three. So essentially now we're having a sort of a circulator that sends this fundamental mode from A, from one to two, and this, uh, diffuse light from two to three. This allows us to have a, a system that is entirely fiber-based from the laser to the patient to the detector. How it is made is made in uh, one of my uh, colleagues' laboratory, Laboratoire des Fibres Optiques, which has been at Polytechnic for over 25 years. Uh, many companies have, have spun out of this lab. Um, and this is um, one of the state-of-the-art fiber-making facilities. So these two blocks here are holding two fibers in close proximity. You have a micro torch, which comes, everything is computer controlled, and you essentially melt those two fibers over a uh, prescribed region at a certain temperature, and once you have, you're, you're melting, those two fibers are coalescing together, and as you taper them, you can monitor the energy transfer and prescribe this recipe for each coupler you're making. So in an endoscopy setup, Typically, you would have uh, the laser light, you'd have your micro-optics, the scanning mechanism. This is the spectrally encoded um, mechanism that we can talk in a whole different uh, 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 talk. And then the fiber optics will essentially send you to some detecting, uh, detecting scheme. Uh, so the next, uh, the experiment that I want to show you is essentially taking an endoscopy setup but just replacing a standard 50-50 coupler with a double cloud fiber. So the setup gets slightly more complicated as we are trying to do interferometry with the core and are trying to extract some of the light to trigger our signal. But the point that I want to make in this is that everything from the laser to the sample is entirely fiber coupled. So there's no free space, there's no room for, for mistakes or for misalignment. So we're imaging here something that's totally illegal in the US. It's a figurine uh, stored inside uh, the egg of a Kinder Surprise. I don't know if you've if you heard about this. Yes, it says this is so dangerous, but I'm, I went through the border with it. Don't tell anyone. So we're, we're taking with a, uh, we're making a two dimensional image with a single fiber optics with a scanner. So we're doing a raster scan here. And the image that we get is the face of Merlin here. So the field of view is here. We see the nose, the eyes, and the spectacles of Merlin. The image is very granular, right? Do anyone knows what this phenomenon is? Why do I see those little dots on the image, and why? Anyone knows what these dots are? Speckle, Speckle right? And these are the result of me illuminating a rough surface, Merlin. Right? with coherent illumination and doing coherent detection. Again, I'm using the core of my double cloud fiber. So it's single mode in, single mode out with a laser. I'm perfectly coherent, I get speckle. Would it be the same on my skin? Absolutely, my skin is also rough on the, the wavelength scale of this, um, this illumination scheme. If I now look at, take my double cloud fiber and do illumination through the core, so I can have this diffraction limited illumination. But now I use the signal coming back from the inner cladding. I do three things. First, I get, I get much more photons. I cannot show the two images on the same intensity scale as Merlin and A, which just wouldn't show up. I have almost a hundredfold increase in the second image. The second thing that I, that I, that I do, and it's very important for clinicians, I, wash out, I wash, wash out some of the speckles, right? Why is that? 
I have coherent illumination, but I have incoherent detection. So this is a partially coherent scheme that allows me to get rid of some of the speckle. And in addition, something that is really good for endoscopy, I increase my depth of field. So all of a sudden, I start seeing Mervyn's ears a little more into focus, or whatever the structure is behind the eyes. Image in A, is it still useful? Now that I have this higher intensity, low speckle, higher depth of field, it is, because it still has this phase information that through interferometry I could extract, right? So if I play with a reference arm and do some clever trick in the Fourier transform, I can get now a combined image that has the depth in color and the high intensity from B. And I get the depth from the inter information from A that still carries the phase. So I can still get the depth from where the image was taken and the intensity from the inner cladding. Is there a way we can lower the, 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 the lights for one or two slides? I know I'm the last speaker of the day, so if this is your like 30 seconds power and up. Oh, wow, that's perfect, okay. So I was telling you that the raison d'être of our lab is to go into the clinics, so I'm not impressing any doctor showing a plastic figurine, right? So we went into something slightly more tricky with a biological sample, and right now we're, we just started with a mouse embryo, you sort of see it, right? So this is a mouse, it's, it's playing the Wii, right, Nintendo? I'm, I'm, this is an old faculty trying to be cool, so I apologize for that, <laughs> right? So you see, you can sort of count the fingers, right? I see its ear, but again, the image is crippled with speckle noise. What do I do? I just change the, the fiber optics. So I haven't done any image processing for the very good reason that I can't. But um, I just, just changed the hardware, and this is what we get. This is the signal-to-noise improvement that we get just by having a fiber optics that was designed for the purpose of biomedical application. So what do we get? It's, as a signal, uh, an image that has a much better signal-to-noise ratio, right? You see the, the background is actually black. You can count the pods. You have much less speckle, but you still have the resolution. And you have this increased depth of field at the same time. So this, um, I, I asked some of you if you had the entrepreneurial spirit in you. I didn't. I, it was never my intention to start a company. This is my confession of 2017. But um, when we launched, when we published this, many people saw the interest. So the first five people emailed us and were like, yeah, we'll make a copy of the coupler. And then these people published. And so now we had 25 people calling us and we're like, yeah, we can't not spend the rest of our lives make copies, right? Just, just, uh, and, and just send them to everyone. And we need this to be more readily available. So we were, uh, we, we found the best route to commercialize this and it ended up that the best way to make it was that we kept making it, but we actually trained people to do it. So we created with the school and with, um, the founder of another successful company called Thor Labs. We created this company called Castor. Uh, Castor is a start, it's Alpha Gemini, right? And if you speak either Spanish or French, you also notice the, 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 the other hidden meaning of Castor, so I'll let you uh, find this out on your own. But let's say for the photonics crowd, it is Alpha Gemini. And um, we, within a matter of a few months after founding the company, so we founded the company in May, and in February of the following year, we had this commercial product uh, sold throughout the world on the Thor Labs website. And since, uh, since February 15, we've been uh, improving this line of components uh, uh, through Castor and uh, some through the school as well. So what are the applications? Um, right now there are many, uh, some in SPR sensing, and I promised myself I would include some, but I want to keep this, this talk rather short. So let's stick to the biomedical applications. Uh, applications in confocal microscopy, in OCT, optical coherence tomography, and also interagnostic. Uh, inspired by Professor Falco, I want to put, put some arts in, the, um, in my talk. Anyone knows the relationship between confocal microscopy in 2001, A Space Odyssey. The founder, the, the pioneer inventor of confocal microscopy is Marvin Minsky. Marvin Minsky is also recognized in the AI community as one of the founders, the pioneers of artificial intelligence. And he was 
not only asked by Kubrick to be one of the scientific advisors in that epic movie, but the main character, Kaminsky, was named after him. So this is, again, another link between popular science, popular um, culture, and science. Confocal microscopy, the use of pinhole to be able to have optical sectioning. Optical sectioning means that you can image through thick samples with a uh, micron resolution. This is, these are red blood cells flowing through the heart of a Xenopus embryo. And clearly this is optical sectioning. Real sections would have killed the guy, but the heart is still beating, so we're imaging through it. It turns out that if you want to do confocal microscopy in the clinics, you can replace the pinholes with an optical fiber. And the trick that we play is that we don't have the same pinhole size, again, from the illumination to the detection. So we use slightly larger pinhole for detection, again, to remove the speckle and to have more photons coming in. So the double clad is also very useful to this. We use the core, uh, the core for illumination and the inner cladding for detection. However, if you plot the thickness, so the optical sectioning as a function of, of the diameter of the collection panel, if you use the fiber that I first showed you with the very large inner cladding, you get tons of photons back, but you have no more sectioning. If you use a single mode fiber, single mode fiber, you get really tight sectioning, but you have tons of speckle and almost no light back. So we need to have this compromise of a factor of about five that prompted us to make custom fibers. But also now, this is our double clad fiber with the core here and the inner cladding. But now it gets much harder to make a coupler because we have this much glass to go through. So when we, we, we put our other fiber here and we do our tapering, Yes, we can have this blue, the light from the inner cladding go to the other fiber, but now the core starts to talk as well, and that's, that was an issue that we had. So we came up with this clever trick where we essentially taper the fiber prior to making the coupler. So again, this is the double clad fiber with the reduced inner cladding, and we do an adiabatic taper very slow to the point where the inner cladding at the fuse section has the same diameter as the original core, such that the light fundamental mode that is propagating here diffracts out, but then again at the fuse section is trapped again by, by the inner cladding that now has the properties of the core. And so here you can put your other fiber, extract the inner cladding light, and still confine this fundamental mode which goes back into the core after the fuse section. So we have again the same coupler where uh, from port one to port two, the fundamental light goes with 95% and we can extract uh, upwards of 85% into the other uh, branch. So this allows us to have confocal microscopy image where we can go much deeper and have a greater signal to noise ratio without compromising sectioning. This is exciting, but not as much as optical coherence tomography. It is, I don't know if you, you've heard of optical coherence tomography with Professor Barton a few years ago. Um, this is a, a new way to rebrand the Michelson interferometer, except this time, as opposed to using a coherent light source, you use an incoherent light source to probe tissue in depth. Again, inspired by Professor Falco, I, I put some uh, piece of art here. Why? Because OCT uh, was, um, is, is being investigated as a way to study the different layers in the painting through interferometry. But back to biomedical applications. OCT, as I said, is an interferometry technique. In the time domain way to perform OCT, you would split your laser light into a diffuse sample and some of the light to a reference mirror. Your laser is low coherence such that only the light that is reflected within a few microns of the, uh, the optical distance from the reference arm will contribute to your interfer interference. And as you move the reference mirror, you get to scan your sample in depth. So if this is a representation of my finger, and I am afraid I'm a better scientist than drawer, this is, this is what I thought a finger looks like. But um, if you ask me to, to do an image, this is what I actually I can produce with an OCT system, which is much more believable. So you have the skin, the cuticle, and the nail. And if I flip my finger uh, the other way around, you get, as we saw in Professor Barton's lab, you get here the finger pad with the sweat glands, sweat ducts going out this way. 
Why is this exciting? Uh, we can use it in cardiology to look at vulnerable plaques. We, we use it in the GI system to look at Barrett's esophagus. In my lab, we use OCT and laryngology to look uh, at pathologies on the vocal folds, and we have uh, we can see uh, pathologies that couldn't have been seen before because it's very hard to take biopsies of the vocal folds without affecting phonation. So you actually see cysts uh, that with a precision that is an accuracy that is uh, very interesting for uh, physicians. So in our lab, this is this is what we do. So we have we, we've done upwards of 100 patients. But the the reason we're excited with the back to the double CAD is that if you look at OCT, OCT is really good at giving you an idea of the morphology. So you would see cell layers uh, really nicely, but you don't have information about the composition of those layers. You don't have any information about the molecular content of it. Um, and this is, um, this is what the, we believe the double cloud fiber can bring to the OCT world. So what I'm going to show you is results of collaboration with a group in Australia. Uh, where uh, we are building an OCT through a needle. So essentially the fiber is in the needle and, and the needle pokes tissue and as we turn the needle and pull back, we get the, the full 3D view. The idea of using this fiber is that we can, within the same fiber, launch the OCT light and a fluorescence excitation laser. OCT comes back unperturbed into its detection arm and then the fluorescence goes back into a separate PMT. If we look at a phantom, just to orient ourselves for geometry, uh, again, this is where the needle is. The needle takes a radial picture, and as it turns around, gets a full radial view. And as you pull back, you get the 3D view. OCT gives you an idea of the structure. So you see three channels in which we put no fluorescine, the, the fluorescine, and then half the concentration. And the fluorescence from the inner cladding can give you an, an idea on the composition. Again, this is. Not exciting. We're looking, well, this is exciting as a proof of principle. What is really exciting is as you get in vivo. So less than a year after making the, the double cloud fiber commercially available, it was used by a group in Vancouver, in humans, in vivo, so through an endoscope that is, uh, that is sent through the mouth inside the bronchus. And what you see now, uh, you see again the radial view, so it's a rotating endoscope with the fiber optics. You see the OCT that provides a really nice insight on the layers, on the, on the structural composition uh, of, of this, this organ. But you also get information about the etofluorescence. And as you do a pullback, you get the full map of here the uh, blood vessels that are around the bronchus. And this group is now studying the, uh, so again, these are three different views from this whole map. So you get both the autofluorescence, which informs you about the collagen and elastin content in terms of concentration, uh, combined with the structural information in depth that OCT provides. We are in our lab, we're also combining OCT with hyperspectral imaging. Again, because we're using, we're having so much more signal from the inner cladding, we can do, um, we can do white light, send white light, and do white light spectroscopy. And then once we have this information, we can recon reconstruct this whichever way we want. Here we're simply imaging a plant leaf. So we have the OCT blood, the 3D information of the leaf, but on top we can add the color and the molecular composition. This is slightly more convincing on an orange peel that has a green tape on it. The contrast is very high. Um, and again, no one studies the pathologies of oranges, so we, we actually looked at skin pathologies. Uh, so this, is, this was just recently published by uh, Robin and Xavier in, in the room here, where we, with through our fiber, the core images with OCT, so you're seeing a wound and the re epithelization within under the scab. And on top of that, you can overlay the RGB of reconstruction where you actually see the inflammation, the color that the, the clinician has been used to diagnose before OCT came about. And through an even more recent paper, we've also used, uh, looked at the back of the eye with collaboration with Kenny Tao, where we combine uh, with our fiber through the core, we do a CT and our cladding, we do uh, laser scanning confocal ophthalmoscope. And so we can combine the two views simultaneously. Do you allow me five more minutes? Uh, sure. Yeah. 
So uh, in addition to show you art, we can show you that uh, light can destroy art. So we, you, you all know that uh, OC, light can be used, lasers can be used to remove tattoos. Um, with this fiber, we're also thinking that if we turn the design around, we can combine diagnostic and therapy through in a combined word that the community now starts talking about diagnostic, so the, the, the new word, the, the new buzzword in our community. So this is the next step that we're, that we're taking. If you change the étendue ratio at the coupler, as opposed to have the big fiber here to extract light, we have a small fiber here to inject light. We have now this single fiber imaging scheme through the core and also uh, concurrent delivery of higher power laser to first do marks onto the skin and eventually going towards ablation of tissue. So the idea would, have to, would be to have concurrent diagnostic and therapy, laser therapy. But we're not there yet, so we're going step by step. This, in this collaboration with Brett Buma at uh, the Wellman Center at Harvard Med School, we are trying to provide clinicians with a marking scheme where if you see a pathology in uh, Barrett's esophagus, if you see with OCT pathology and you need to correlate with histology, you leave a little mark such that the endoscopist can, knows where to take the biopsy as opposed to have a random. So this is our first step. Um, in, in this very first uh, iteration, we ha you have here the two OCT images of a swine esophagus. And as we're sending laser pulses, you actually see the coagulation threshold happening here when you send enough energy to go above 60 degrees C. And you actually see this coagulated mark that you leave on the tissue, which is it's great because you both see it on OCT and on uh, the endoscopy. So after you can come and go take, grab that biopsy. We've re refined the coupler and the technique such that we can do a single pulse coagulation. In this movie, you see a swine OCT, uh, OCT image of a swine esophagus on the left and the endoscopist view on the right. And what you see, oh, I'm sorry, I went too fast. You see the coagulation, laser, coagulation beam being turned on and the, the um, the coagulation happening on OCT, and you also see the white mark uh, being formed, uh, exactly co-registered at the same location. We also demonstrated that we can do single pulse coagulation by having a dotted line. So these are all single pulse laser uh, coagulation that is performed through the fiber and concurrent with OCT imaging. So in summary, very briefly, um, I truly believe that for each field, um, you, you can, you can, it's always good to hear about what other fields are doing for the proof of principle to grab the low hanging fruits. You can borrow techniques from different fields, but at one point, if you want to really improve the technique, you need to start designing custom optics, custom fibers, custom lasers, custom detection. So this is uh, what we're doing in Montreal. And in addition, uh, the day before, literally the day before I came here, um, I'm very much involved in the teaching of bio biomedical optics and uh, biophotonics in Montreal. So recently came out with a textbook on the topic. So I invite you, if you're interested, to have a look at it. And with this, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention.